So last month I travelled halfway around the world to the Melbourne International Film Festival to be a mentor on the festival's Critics Campus Scheme, where they pair young Australian critics with seasoned industry professionals like myself, massive air quotes, to develop their writing abilities, practice interview technique and generally do the festival. And I was there despite not having published a whole lot of written criticism in recent years because of my work in the field of video essay, a medium of some interest to a few of the mentees. Speaking of which, here they are in all their glory, posing for a photograph at the end of our time together. And though it's really only a fraction of a generation that separates me at the younger end of the millennials from them at the older end of Gen Z, I was interested to see where our understanding of film culture would overlap and where it would diverge. Here's one way that instantly comes to mind. When they handed me a phone to take this video, I shot it landscape. Like a fucking Lumiere brother. Working in video essay, an audiovisual medium informed, at least for the last 30 years, by the ever-evolving flow of images and sounds through various online channels, I'm always interested in how people online are communicating about pop culture, even if they don't consider that communication to be criticism. Earlier this year, there was a minor Twitter storm around exactly this kind of communication, when the producer of a film called Where Hands Touch, which is a romantic drama about a young mixed race girl in Nazi Germany falling in love with a member of the Hitler Youth, seriously, took unkindly to a number of tweets offering some fairly harsh criticism of the film. And in particular, one which clipped out this scene and compared it to a rom-com style race to the airport, only set in a concentration camp. And so the producer issued copyright takedown notices to Twitter, who dutifully took the tweets down. And to my mind, part of the problem was that he didn't really consider the tweets to be legitimate criticism to begin with. Partly because they were on Twitter, but also, I think, because they were audio-visual. And that kind of thing has always been viewed with skepticism by some. Especially since it went from the sort of thing that only the likes of Godard could feasibly create. Et alors est venu l'étonnante moisson du grand cinéma italien to something your average 13-year-old can knock up in 10 minutes with iMovie and a torrent of Booksmart ripped off French Netflix. Why does this entire movie feel like it was reverse-engineered from its own trailer? Further complicating things, this contemporary online audiovisual discourse has been rapidly co-opted by the industry itself, with the likes of Netflix handpicking only the most positive grassroots takes on something like Bird Box, and amplifying them with the power of millions of dollars. While A24 pumps out cutesy Twitter memes alongside all of its expensive tie-in merch, for those too cool to cheerlead for Disney's growing monopoly, but not cool enough to not cheerlead for a film distribution company at all. In any case, it didn't take long to identify the dominant audiovisual medium among the mentees in Melbourne, because most of them wouldn't stop going on about TikTok, the Chinese video app famous for its viral dance routines and comedy lip-sync clips. The mentees even set up a group account under the handle MIF2019, establishing an unofficial channel for a festival not hip enough to have considered setting up its own TikTok presence. Most of their content wasn't explicitly film-related, instead consisting of snapshots of the week and riffs on already famous TikTok memes, like the tendency of so-called e-boys, attractive but non-threatening teen heartthrobs, to roll their eyes back into their heads and twiddle their fingers on their temples for some reason. And so over the week, I myself got acquainted with TikTok, which seems to be built almost entirely around music and comedy, in a way, there's something quite sweet about a 21st century app that looks so much like a 20th century school talent show, right down to the handful of good-looking boys and girls who aren't really trying at all. But after a few days, part of me was a little glad the app hadn't been around when I was a teenager, and the thought of a perpetual talent show would have been nightmarish. It got me thinking about two recent films about contemporary social media culture, Bo Burnham's Eighth Grade and Liza Mandelup's Jawline which both share this really poignant dynamic in which their protagonists perform confidence and expertise for the camera, while isolated and anxious IRL. Jawline was actually playing at Melbourne, and the festival had brought Liza over for it. If you want proof of how quickly Gen Z culture is evolving, 
Consider the fact that she hadn't even heard the term e-boy, despite making perhaps the definitive documentary on the phenomenon. Still, she made an admirable stab at the little twiddly thing. Tell you what I did like about TikTok though. On the most basic level, it's a platform for reappropriating existing media. And in that sense, it's got a lot in common with video essay. The vast majority of TikTok uploads begin by sampling an existing piece of audio from this constantly growing library of sounds. And thrillingly, the samples that tend to do best on the app don't come from top 40 hits, but instead from the sidelines of popular culture. Just recently, the teens chewed up Cecilia Condit's 1983 video art piece, possibly in Michigan. Which one? Mmm, smells like mother's crazy sister cake. Oh, you think so? Yeah, I do. It smells so good. And spat it out as a TikTok meme. Mmm, smells like mother's crazy sister cake. Oh, you think so? Yeah, I do. It smells so good. This whole sampling framework is crying out to be used in the service of criticism with each new video an opportunity to deconstruct the sample underpinning it. And yet the samples on TikTok are almost never engaged with critically. Take this pretty great phantom thread lip sync I found. I, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just waiting around like an idiot for you. When did this happen? What happened to make you behave like this? You. Here, the sample is the central focus of the video, but it's used in the service of tribute, not critique. In one of my favorite TikTok memes, a solitary teen will film from afar as a group of their peers shoot some highly synchronized TikTok of their own. It plays as a kind of cynical comment on adolescent in-groups, but also shows a rare willingness to critique one of TikTok's dominant modes of address. And so as the talent show goes on, I'm hoping to see more kids standing aside and heckling from the wings. <laughs>